you check out the uh, Fresno State tape again, what you got to make overall of that, that game? Well, I think when you look at, you know, halfway through the season, you know, like I told you after the game, we are who we are in a lot of realms and a lot of spaces to still get better at. You know, I think we still prove as a team we can win in a lot of different ways. You know, and I, I told the team this morning, like, you know, when you walk off the San Jose game and it's 54-52 and, you know, it's a team win, right? Defense isn't feeling too great about themselves, right? You walk off Fresno 25, 18 or 17, whatever it was, sometimes the offense doesn't feel too good. It's a great team win. And we've won a lot of close games. We are really battle tested as a team, you know, um, offensively really watching through the tape. I mean, it's just a, you know, once again, we talked about some of this last year and I'll take it on me, but like a willingness to want to run the ball. You know, I think we have good personnel. I think we got a good old line. Yeah, I think they were stout in there, but everything stems from running the football. And, you know, I think we had nine tailback touches before, you know, midway through the fourth quarter, right? So we've addressed it. We've talked about it. It's got to be part of our identity, and we've been good at it this year. So um, to not really test the waters, I don't think was good enough. And then, you know, pocket progression passing. We're still working on that. There's a lot to improve on. Um, things that we missed, uh, but I thought that was good. Defensively, I thought we hung in there and made the big plays when necessary. Another one of those kind of scrappy performances, maybe like UW, where it does, doesn't look really pretty, but at the end of the day, the job's getting done, and those kids made a bunch of really uh, big plays. Obviously, Ethan's play, uh, TD, to mess up on the same play earlier in the game to come back to make a correction and get a pick. So it was very timely at times, and it was a hard-fought victory, which – I knew I felt it was going to be a hard fought game, so nothing was surprising on that end. Uh, I want to ask about Essa. Uh, no sacks this year, uh, five uh, just total pressures overall. Like, what is or what have you seen from him and for him to kind of turn that around this year? What is well, that just tons in? of growth. I mean, but you got to keep his story in perspective, even understand it. Like, he played offensive lineman one year before we got him, right? So you're, you're in perception, you think, oh, he's a senior, he's been doing this his whole life. Like, it's only his third year really playing football on offensive line. So that jump has been tremendous. Uh, but he's also changed a lot of his intangible pieces, his mentality, how he works. His finishing this year is so much better than it ever was at any point last year. So he's urgent about his work, and I think that he's seen the results of it. I mean, he's turned into a tremendous left tackle. We still got six games to continue improving, and I think eventually that's what the next level we'll see out of him is that – Man, we're taking it. We're taking a kid that's six, seven, three, twenty. That has good feet. That is only his third year playing football. So a lot of exciting times still left for Essa, and just keep attacking one day at a time. Because every once in a while, we got to remind him. Let's let's get after it today. He responded really great, and I think he's played really well this season. Been a really big bright spot for our offense. With the uh, running game, uh, Wei Chong gets going late in the game, and you finally kind of go to him in that spot, like. What was kind of behind not really going to him earlier in the game and for him to kind of break out when he gets I mean, that's that kind of what I talked about a little bit. I mean, I want you to go in and, you know, call the plays. Like, we feel like we were had some outside zone stuff, and that's what we got going late. We just got to get to it earlier. And, you know, I'd, I'd put that on, yeah, obviously, Ben, play calling, but the whole staff, myself, you know, we're in charge of all those things to put our guys in the best positions to win football games. And, you know, I've said it for two years, running the football is a big part of that. Jake, you guys obviously started off pretty fast with the two quick touchdowns. Yeah. And then was it kind of something that Fresno State shifted on defense? Or do you think it was just a lack of execution on offense that kind of involved that lull? I mean, a little bit of both. I mean, we emphasize starting fast. Uh, they won all their games by leading at halftime. And we felt like we could jump on them. And, you know, not that we took the foot off the pedal, but, you know, then we had two takeaways there, turnovers in the second quarter, stalled us a little bit. It was a low possession game. You know, I mean, even us driving, we didn't have the explosive plays that we were used to having. Uh, we limited their explosive plays. So I think each team had 10 or 11 possessions, which is low uh, for us. So they made us grind it out a little bit, which was different than, you know, how we've scored in the past. We've had a bunch of explosive plays every week. So uh, we got to look at that, stay patient. And you know, like I said, running the ball and stay ahead of the chains allows you to attack them a little bit better. So I think that's all a big part of it. But credit to Fresno, they played well. And when you look at this Hawaii team on tape, um, you know, a little bit of a mixed bag so far this year. What, do you, what kind of jumps out to you? I mean, it's just it's one of those things where it's a maturity test. I mean, you can look at the record or you can look at the film, right? What, what do you want to do? And defensively, really every step of the way, they've been, they've been on it, right? They've been fast. They've been aggressive. 
Uh, they're a little bit undersized, but their team speed is above average, and I think they play physical. You know, it's hard to contain Genty, and I thought they did it uh, to, to the ability to keep themselves in a fourth quarter game. Uh, so they're going to do it in multiple different ways when you watch them, odd front, even front, pressure, man, zones. You know, they, they do it. And one thing I know about playing this Hawaii team in my past in 17 and 18, they, they play hard. And there is no ifs, ands, or buts. Like, you don't earn your way on that field for that program and that culture without playing extremely hard. So it's our second crack at the run and shoot. Uh, unfortunately, it is the second time. The first one did not go so well. So we got to adjust how we play that. But they'll also see some of our base ideas for it. So we got to play that chess match. Uh, I think they're more authentic to the true run and shoot. So um, you know we got to be better on defense. and. They, they got our attention because when you go against an offense and you don't, you know, obviously San Jose, we didn't play the way we wanted to. You know, we gotta, we'll have a fiery week of practice to go prove we can defend this stuff. How much credit, um, obviously the defense made, made a lot of plays. How much, how much credit of that goes to Coach Schmetting and kind of what have been his triumphs and learns throughout the course of this year? Coaching-wise or the players you're saying? Uh, Coaching-wise, yeah. Well, I just think we'll take, for, as a general defensive team and a defensive unit is stay the course. We do have the people to play good defense. I've said that all the time. It's just been some peaks and some valleys and not a lot in between sometimes. So consistency is the battle. We're six games in. I think we played six good offenses. When I look back on it, I do. So um, every week's a new and different challenge. But I think you know, we still got to get pressure on the quarterback more. Uh, when we stop the run, when we eliminate big explosive plays, uh, Ethan O'Connor was great. I mean, he had the two picks, one that counted. So I just think we got to just keep playing our game. We got to be versatile and we got to put our guys in the best position to make plays. But, you know, you didn't see all the busts out there. You saw better communication. Like, we got to demand that. And I think when you demand it, you see it on the field. So I do think that's part of coaching. And then um, for both of your coordinators, what are kind of your goals and vision? Where should they be by the end of the season for, for your team to be successful? I think they should be here. Is that what you're asking? Or no, 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 no. Like, just what are your goals for them? Yeah. Oh, I mean, just the same they have with the players. Like, every day is a quest to be our best. And there's a preparation point in that, Sam, that we got to just attack every day. This is a grind. You know, we coming off the bye week, sometimes you get out of a little bit of rhythm, like we're back at it Monday morning, right? We only get one Tuesday, one Wednesday. And I think I demand the same thing I do as a player is everything that they got, right? Put, put our guys in the best position to make plays. Don't make excuses. Find ways for us to be successful, stay ahead of the game, and most importantly, never get complacent. You know, I think anytime you get complacent in football, in your job, in, in high performance as a player, that's when we start seeing diminishing returns. So keep grinding on it. I think the season is set up great to have two bye weeks, even as a coach. Uh, so excited about where we need to keep going and getting better. And trust me, there's nobody that's comfortable on that fifth floor. I mean, it's a tough opponent and homecoming, and we got to play our best. Six games down, six games to go. What's the most important thing for you know your staff to get this team ready for to finish strong in the second half of the season? This afternoon's walkthrough. I mean, it's that simple. Like you got to make sure you're boiling it down to every minute detail, and you just keep working the process. Right, because sometimes, you know, you get halfway through a season and you got 120 guys and you got guys that are all, you know, 100% bought in and focused and you got scout team guys and you got homesick guys and you got you just got you know, guys that are worried about their e-contest. I mean, so just every moment you walk in this building, be present with what you're doing, right, and be attentive to that work. I think that's what leads to a lot of success. And we've had some success, so our process works. Don't deviate from it. Don't press it. Just keep working and being, you know, present every day. And I think it's going to lead to a lot of great results. Opportunity this week to get to bowl eligibility is. I know that how important the bowl streak was to yeah. you when you took over. Just is that something that, if if you accomplish that, you can celebrate in season, or is it just is there such a blur of trying to get ready for the next week? It's not something that really sets until the end of the year. Yeah, I think it's a. One week at a time, you know, with an end of the year vision, I think it is a good accomplishment. You know, I think it shows that your program is in the whatever now, the top half of FBS football. And I think that is good, right? But, you know, hopefully if we win this game, like we're not going to sit there and dwell on it. You know, we're going to accomplish something that is important to us. It's important to our fans. 
I'm never going to act like that's not a big step in our football program to win those games. But as soon as we celebrate it for 24 hours, we're going to wash it. So we got to go earn this one. I think it's a it's a big challenge for us. Can you uh, talk about the decision to go for two there after the first touchdown in the first quarter? Yeah, I mean, like I said, we're, we're going to play to win. We're not going to be afraid of losing. And there's things that We've had that play up the last four weeks. Uh, we didn't score first the last couple of weeks, and we feel like we're going to try to take advantage of something. We didn't execute it exactly how we wanted, um, but we're going to play with an edge. And, you know, we, we thought actually, I actually went in the game th thinking we're going to play a high scoring football game and to try to get them chasing us. It ended up being us chasing them a little bit when you don't get it. You know the risk involved with that. But, uh, you know, we've done that, I think, four or five times the last couple of years. And, some work, some don't, but you know that that's what goes into it is a calculated play that we feel like it's going to work, and when it doesn't, you know, makes you look kind of silly. Felt like uh, there was a, more of an emphasis on blitzing, um, especially as the game kind of went on to try and get after Keen. Was that something that was kind of talked about in the bye week, trying to you know generate pressure with five or six guys, and you know maybe bringing some of those stunt blitzes with the linebackers and so on? Yeah, and I think Keith Brown did a good job of of causing some pressures too. I mean, it's real simple defensive football that lasts over time. You can't get there with three, bring four. You can't get there with four, bring five. Five, bring six. I mean, so we just had to, like, we got to get pressure on the quarterback. And, you know, to allow a player like that to sit back there and be comfortable is just not going to work. So really happy with the way they went out there in the final two minutes and really shut the door with four-man pressure. But um, we got to be more versatile. And, you know, I think we got to do the same thing this week. When we played San Jose, we didn't affect the quarterback. So got to find ways to do it. But... You know, in today's offense, the ball comes out pretty quick. And then, you know, I think there was maybe some, fair to say, some struggles in the run game defensively. That is, um, you know, I think Gilliam went for over 100 yeah. yards. Is that something, what kind of did you see on tape with that? There was um, some schematic stuff. They did a good job. Um, we probably didn't react fast enough to it, to some FIB jet motion. You know, it, offenses are good. They find ways to get different guys in fits. They got competitive in the fit on a couple different things. And, you know, he, he misfits something. Sometimes they cracked us out out of the closet sets. So there's some good schematics on that end. And, you know, we got to keep staying ahead of the chains and, and being aggressive in those situations. So a lot of learns. Uh, people will continue to do that to us. But, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of where some of those hit. Uh, what did you see from John on Saturday? Maybe good and not so good, just kind of watching it back to um, this weekend and today. Well, I just think you got to take it all in, in different phases. You know, I think he takes the, the turnovers hard as he should. I mean, he's the one that makes all the big decisions with the football. And, you know, the first one started just getting a little bit loose carrying it. And then the second one just kind of, you know, didn't, didn't hold the safety enough to try to squeeze the inside fade in there. But, you know, some good. We're going to build on the good. Uh, some were still progression passing. We just got to be more direct with his eyes, especially the pressure. Like, hey, you see this pressure. This is where we want to go one to two. And just be clean on that. Um, through six games, John has been fantastic. Let's not lose sight of that either. Um, there, there's some definite deficiencies that we need to continue to work on. He's a young player. Uh, we have his attention. I just want to make sure he's not too hard on himself too uh, because he is growing and he is learning. Off of that, him being hard on himself. And he said after the game too, he, he knows he can play better football. Um, how does he pivot from that on just getting back out of practice? And what do you see like kind of his energy shifting towards like, oh, if he's hard on himself on his turnovers in yeah. this game, like is he really honing in on that during practice? Do you see that? Yeah, John's a competitor. I mean, first and foremost, that's, that's where all his success comes from is that he just loves competing. He loves being out there. But John's not doing this alone. You know, we dropped six passes. You know, protections weren't always where they always needed to be. Like, good quarterback play is good offensive play. It's good together play. It's a team play. I mean, so um, there's things that we all got to do to help the quarterback. And John owns when he misses or he makes a bad, bad play. So it was just one thing or another. We just weren't in sync all 11 as an offense. Okay, we found a way to win a game. So uh, I think that says a lot about a mature team. And, and John owns his piece of it, but we got to get better as a complete 11, and, and we will, but it starts with practicing with your hair on fire. Same thing when we talked about defense not getting what they want. Okay, offense, good. We won a game. Let's go back out there and identify what we need to do to get better. Tyson said in his post game that he thought it was the, your team's best communication of the season. Obviously, I know you said it was a big emphasis on the bye week to fix the defensive communication. You already spoke about it a little bit, but what was sort of your overarching analysis of kind of that defensive communication? 
Well, I just think anything in life, in coaching, in football, like you see what you demand, you know. So it was a big emphasis on my part to the coaches, like it's not getting done, like that's on us, right? We got to demand that it happens. And if it doesn't happen, restart the play. Don't allow the mistake to continue because we're not building proper habits that really get to the game field, right? If they're just happening in practice and we're not getting it to, you know, application, we're not doing a good job coaching. So those guys took it to heart. I think there was some hard conversations, you know, some call-ups to say, hey, this isn't getting done, guys, and it's costing us in X, Y, and Z. So I think they took it to heart. They looked at it. They worked at it, and we saw the results of it. Now that's one game, and we got to continue to do it if we want to be successful. And obviously a physical game against Fresno got chippy at times. Did it sort of feel like with the atmosphere that you've spoken about this game, the Boise State game, sort of like those future rivalries that you're building against future Pac-12 opponents? Well, it was, it was half off beers in the Fresno Stadium. Like, it was rowdy. Like, crossing those, those fans up there, man, they were, they're, it was good. They had a happy hour before the game. That's a fantastic idea, right, to get fans in there. Like, I'm just thinking of myself as a fan. I would come early for that. Okay, so... It was a, yeah, big time atmosphere. Um, so, like I said, going on the road twice and playing in front of sellout crowds and third down, it's hard to communicate. I mean, that's college football. That's why you love it. That's why you love it. That's why you love competing. I mean, it was a tremendous battle in there. And that's the way Gisa Field needs to be. And it can be. We just got to make that choice. And it's homecoming. It's exciting. But as a competitor, I mean, you love that. And we had a whole section of Cougs. We got to sing the fight song with them after. Just so appreciative of them showing up and supporting our team. And a lot of Cali Cougs had family there. I mean, it was a real positive win um, when we were uh, just kind of celebrating after the game. And then just what did you make of uh, Carlos' first performance? Yeah, I mean, I think just kind of taking him and Jamuri in the whole picture. I mean, we knew it was always going to be a work-in game. Um, you know, I think he had one drop early, and then we got to just keep battling and keep finding a rhythm. And once again, it'll be ultra competitive at practice. We can only roll out three or four receivers at a time. And, you know, Chris has stepped up in his absence. Josh has stepped up in his absence. So um, he just come back and ready to compete and keep earning his way through it, and he'll become a big part of our offense. I know he will. He's too talented not to. Homecoming's always interesting because whether you're somebody who grew up around WCU your whole life or maybe you just came here to go to school, it seems like the alumni base always has this great love for the school. I'm just wondering for you, you know, a, a school halfway across the country from where you grew up, a stop, you know, however many stops into your career, mm -hmm. and obviously WCU holding the place it does in your heart. Did you ever expect when you took this DC job that you would ever become so intertwined with this university? That's a great question. You know, I think as you go throughout your journey, you know, I came here originally, just full disclosure, because it was one of 60 power five defensive coordinator jobs in the country. And when you do that, you're, you're part of the 1% that's doing this, right? And to, to go through everything we have, uh, to now sit in this chair, to now wear this logo with extreme pride, to now have five years of my family being in this town and this community and being an integral part of it, like you feel that, like from a family. Like I, I feel that. Like this is now more our kids' home. I think we're ingrained in every piece of Washington State, and I think it means something to us. You know, but when we sing the song, you know, back home, back home song after the first quarter, like, I'm sure they're talking about homecoming. Let's all find our way back home. And talking to alums all over the country, sometimes it's, you know, this isn't the easiest place to get back to. But I think when you do that, you share those memories, you share those times, you understand what it means to be a former player to put this logo on. Uh, the crimson and gray means a lot to a lot of people. So I think that's what homecoming always represents. And, you know, I'll try to find a, a past alumnus that's coming back to the game to talk to our guys because our players do need to understand, like, they're part of something that's way bigger than themselves. Hundreds of years of a university and a football program and history, and sometimes you just worry about the right now, but you gotta understand, like, you're representing, you know, a lot of people that wore that jersey number, right? You should have a lot of pride in that, and, uh, you know, I think it's gonna be a great football game with an energizing crowd, and it's at 12.30, like, celebrate that, right? So, um, excited to get this one kicked off. Shoot, I was going to build off Austin's question a little bit, but when you try to, obviously being a Coug is special and that's hard to convey unless you've been in yeah. that spot. When you're trying to get guys to come play here or maybe the guys that are here, they're transferring, they're 
freshmen, how do you convey or maybe what do you even say to convey like what a special place this is and maybe how do the veterans help that as well? I think you hit the nail on the head. It's got to come through our people. You know, one of the biggest things I tell recruits all the time is, you know, get here and then ask them what it's like. You know, ask them what, what is Coach Dicker like? What is it like to be in a small town? What's game day like? How are you treated throughout the community? Like, those are the things that are really important to understand the, the men that are going through it to share that experience. Because I think you do got an obligation. Uh, it's a unique place, but I know this in recruiting. Everyone that leaves here goes, Coach, that was – you know, way better than what I thought it was or what it was going to be. I said, that's because you hit Google and all you find is a bunch of farmlands, right? So it's one of those things where you just got to be here. You got to understand it. And I think the guys that really see it all the way through, I think mean, they look back at their time here, you know, towards the end or you get to my age, you're just like, man, that really shaped who I am. I went through something hard. It wasn't always easy. Sometimes I felt you know, isolated out of my comfort zone, but that made me grow up and mature. And I think uh, it's a big, big selling point in recruiting to just know that, you know, their kids are going to be taken care of and they get ingrained in this type of culture here at Washington State. I think it, uh, Saturday was uh, KT's fewest snaps uh, as a starter outside of the couple FCS games the last two years. Was there been kind of an emphasis to get Keith and Parker more snaps and get them more involved and have kind of more of a frequent rotation at linebacker? This PFF has made you guys really smart. I mean, are you doing? Are you ta you tab you tabulating this like as the game's happening? No. Okay. All right. All right. You guys, you guys are on me here. No. Um, ro rotating is very important. You know, I think we look back to like I'm trying to think one game where KT took 95 percent of the reps, and he's just a better player when he plays 50 to 60 reps versus 85, and he's still playing special teams on punt, on kickoff. He does a lot for our team, and I think anytime you give that backup, whether it's Keith or Parker or whoever, whatever position, you give them, say, hey, you're going to get 15 to 20 snaps. It's amazing the energy and focus that they bring to those 15 to 20 snaps. So I think rotating is important. And, you know, I think the more Keith proves that he can do it, you know, the more you're going to be challenged to be out there. And I thought he played, you know, pretty well this week. And then noticed uh, Jalen Edmond played the first four in special teams. Haven't seen him the last two. Has that been kind of a, an effort to keep him out and preserve that redshirt, or just kind of how things have played out? I mean, things, it's how they played out a little bit, but also, yeah, I mean, the redshirt's on the back of our mind, yet we kind of moved him back into that, you know, nickel cover position. And uh, with Jackson out uh, last game, and hopefully he's going to be back, you know, he Jalen was kind of that emergency nickel guy. So... Can you ever really say everyone's red shirt anymore? He's got to stay ready. He's had a good attitude about it, which I've been very uh, happy with. And, you know, we got we to gotta keep going because, you know, like Boogie goes down and then you get thin. I mean, Moku has a fingernail come off and bleeding everywhere, gets stitches on the sideline. I mean, these guys are warriors out there. So um, it's cool to see just all the sacrifices that are made to, to go out there and win games. Could have gone without hearing about the fingernail right. anyways. Right. Uh, you mentioned Jackson. Kind of what's uh, the injury outlook for him, Nick, Ryan, Billy, and so on this week? Yeah, I mean, Billy, I think he's going to be back in Indy on Tuesday. Uh, Jackson will be back in Indy on Tuesday. You know, Nick's been cleared by the PT to, to start really kicking. I mean, we're trying to get there. So to be this, this point in the season and be this healthy, you know, feel really good about that. But it also goes back to how we train them. I mean, that means they're ready, they're physical, uh, they can handle, you know, everything that comes with it. Uh, quickly on Nick, he's like dressed out and warmed up for the last few games. Obviously, he's not played. Is that him just kind of deciding in the end, like, you know, my body doesn't feel right? Or is that a doctor saying, you're not ready? Or how's that going? Yeah, I mean, we've tried to get him to the point where he can get out there and get it done, and we just haven't gotten to that point. So, um, you know, I listen to our medical team, and they say he's out, he's out. And that's deciding that he shouldn't yeah. play. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then uh, with the pass rush, you mentioned that part of the issue there is getting them, or facing third downs where it's, you know, uh, shorter distances. I think seven yeah. of their ten uh, third downs were six or uh, shorter. Like, yeah. how much of an emphasis is it to kind of get teams in longer third downs? And like, how can you guys do that? Well, stop the run. You know, and I think at times we just have not been there. I mean, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but you know, we're, you're over five yards of carry on average. That's not going to put yourself in third downs that you can really go out there and attack. So now they can run, now they can run, you know, man zone beaters. I mean, there's a lot of different options at their disposal. A lot of people go for it on fourth down and two or less. So all those things are just coming into it where if you can't get the TFLs, you can't get the sacks, you can't get them behind the chains, like, you know, they're always playing in an attack posture and you're always being defensive. So 
we, we got to stop the run a little bit better on early downs to have a little bit better third down success. Missed a similar play early in the game, and then and then made it uh, t towards the end. Obviously, the the huge game game changing interception. Yeah. Um, was there a conversation after that first play, and then what was your reaction, kind of, and your conversation with him, interaction with him afterward once he made the play at the towards the end of the game? Listen, I've just been proud of Ethan that a couple weeks ago, you know, he got that a penalty and it really threw him off. Right. This week he got the penalty on the hands of the face, third down, kind of big penalty in the game, and he stayed with it. And great things happen when you do that. So, yeah, he learned early in the game. He just didn't, you know, there's a little bit better spacing by them early in the game. And this one he aggressively saw it, went and got it, made the big play, uh, was mature, crossed the end zone before he celebrated, right, all those different type of little things you talk about. So it all starts with him staying in the moment and be able to delete a mistake. And that's big for a young player. So just really proud of him growing in that realm, seeing it on the iPad, and then going out there and making it happen. And with that kind of technology piece, obviously you have the iPads being new this year. How beneficial has that been for you guys? It's been huge. I mean, it's just there's no secrets anymore. You know, and I, I still talk about it as a player, like you got to be able to be mature enough as you're playing to see a mistake and, and look at it as a correction point versus like hindering your mind and putting doubt in there. So... I think our coach has done a good job, but it's both ways. Like, you know, they see a pressure, you know, they, you know that they're going to see it and have a game plan for it. So you got to constantly be in a state of adjustment. I think it's advanced coaching to a degree where there's no more guesswork and you got to be out there really hammering out all these adjustments to making sure your guys are ready. Anybody else? All right, go Cougs. Thank you, guys.